instructor and a consultant here at the Sanford Institute of Philanthropy. And we are glad that you are joining us today to talk about stewardship of planned gift donors. Our mission statement here at the Sanford Institute of Philanthropy is to help nonprofits significantly increase their fundraising capabilities and impact that they have in their communities and society through proven contemporary curriculum presented by world-class nonprofit leaders, best in-class faculty, and renowned philanthropists. Wanted to give a shout out to all of our affiliate partners across the United States. We know that there are people logging in from different regions around the country, Arizona, definitely people up in um, different areas of California, John F. K. University, Maricopa Community College. In Florida, we've got National Leadership Institute in Louisiana. We have Xavier University of Louisiana. Nebraska is Bellevue University. In New York, we've got Long Island University. And in San Diego, we've got Augustana University, and in Washington is the University, the City University of Seattle. So we're just really excited to have everyone here and potentially more folks that are joining us from around the country. As you know, our classes have already empowered nearly 27,000 nonprofit leaders, and there's a real buzz out there, and you're a part of making that happen. We've heard that 99% of our um, folks from the classroom feel energized by our instructors and really engaged. So thank you and we're looking forward to you being more engaged today and, and asking questions and using the chat feature so that we can hear what your interests are. If you're tweeting, if you're on Facebook, if you're on any kind of social media um, channel, please use the hashtag SIPWebinar. It's really exciting for us to see the buzz go beyond the classroom. And SIP webinar gives us an opportunity to go back and see all your tweets and, and also hear what you like about our presentation. So hashtag SIP webinar. It's my pleasure to introduce Kim. She began her involvement at UC San Diego as part of the 50th anniversary communications and events team, subsequently joining the advancement as the development director for the Poise School UCSD the nationally ranked middle and high school for high achieving low income students who strive to become the first in their families to graduate from college. Now as a director on the UC San Diego gift planning team, Kim collaborates with colleagues in other areas of advancement, aiding them in solicitation, negotiation, and closure of planned gifts and manages her own active planned gift donor and prospect portfolio. She spearheads the stewardship of the approximately 400 members of the York Society, UC San Diego's Legacy Giving Recognition Group. She is also the Director of Trust and Estate Administration for UC San Diego. Kim earned her certificate in planned giving as a specialist in planned giving, which is a CSPG designation from California State University, Long Beach in 2016. Kim has a master's degree in journalism from the University of Southern California and spent much of her professional career in the fields of public relations, marketing, and advertising, notably as in senior account executive positions for the international public relations agencies Burston Marsteller and Hill and Knowlton in Los Angeles and San Francisco, and as the top communications executive for National Shopping Center developer The Han Company in San Diego. Kim, we are so happy to have you here today, and I want to hand it over to you. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. I um, have been doing this for about four years now, and um, it's very inspiring to work with planned gift donors. They're, they're some of the most interesting people you could ever hope to meet. So I wanted to kick this off by asking uh, our, our audience uh, where you're joining us from and also maybe even more important, what you're hoping to learn today so that we can try to cover all the topics that everybody is interested in, in uh, learning about and speaking about. Awesome, well, I'm seeing that someone's from London, so I can't wow. just say the United States. We have people from all around the world, and I made a mistake earlier, it wasn't San Diego, it's South Dakota, so let's get that right and see if we have anyone from South Dakota here. We've got San Diego folks, folks from your place, UC San Diego, Tucson and Phoenix, uh, Arizona representing. 
Seattle, Washington. Hopefully I got that city uh, state right. Okay, Portland is here. So we've got folks from all around the country and Excellent. the world. Lucky Excellent. us. Yeah. And so what are we hoping to learn today? Do we have any folks wanting to chime in on that? Okay, I think you guys are going to get a lot of tips from Kim today and in answering your questions about some time effective tips on how you can steward. I think you're going to get some concrete ideas on what you can do when you get off the webinar today and maybe some ideas of what you might want to do in your in your plan over the next year. So keep using the chat feature as Kim's talking and we'll address all the questions. Right. That's something that might come up come to mind as we're, as we're talking. But um, one of the things I wanted to start with is because before you can steward your plan gift donors, you have to know who they are. So how do you find out who they are? And, and, and you know, a lot of plan gift donors are, are anonymous. Uh, they don't tell us that, that uh, we are in their trust or estate. And sometimes, unfortunately, we don't know who they are until, they've, until we are notified by a trustee uh, or an executor that that donor has passed away. And that's really unfortunate. It's sad because if we know who they are before, while they're still alive, we can thank them, we can steward them, and we can make them feel really great about what they're doing for the uh, nonprofit they're supporting. Um, most planned gifts, as you probably know, are made in uh, revocable arrangements like a will or trust. So that means they can change it at any time. Um, life insurance, retirement plans, these are all great plan gift vehicles, really easy to include a, a nonprofit in, in, um, in a vehicle like that, but it can be changed too. The, the beneficiary can be changed, which is another reason why stewardship is super important <laughs> to uh, make sure that uh, your organization stays the beneficiary. So, so how do you know? Well, you can ask. Um, you're in conversation with donors current use donors, um, so ask in a nice way, and they may be the ones you least expect. One of the easy things to do is in your annual report or appeal mailing, something that you might be sending out anyway, is just a sort of bequest campaign, and you can, up on the screen, of course, is, is some language that I threw in there that you can make your own, but um, just let these folks know that their ongoing support has given a, the, your organization a lot of power to continue important work and and maybe uh, they feel strongly enough about it to ensure that the impact continues far into the future um, and talk about legacy gifts um, and you can talk about this more than just in a will or a trust it's um, an IRA or or uh, life insurance or um, any other kind of gift like that um, but they have the power to support your mission and I think that that's really the key message is that they may think oh I'm just making $50 a year or $100 a year or very small gifts um, a couple times a year well you have they have the power to really support your mission and in a big way um, in their estate planning so the other easy way to do it is always use some kind of response card with a check the box language this is so easy just to get in the habit of of, of sending out there um, they can let you know now that yes you're in my will or you're in my retirement plan or you know what i need more information about how i can make you a beneficiary of my will or trust so these are conversation starters even if they just say yes you're in my will well now you have a way to reach out to this person and say well thank you so much what area are you interested in what can we help to learn more about this area and it's it, once again a conversation starter and you're starting the stewardship process right there when they've let you know that they're uh, you're in their um, in their estate plan so why is this important here's some statistics and the the big takeaway here is that that bequests especially can be the largest gift of a donor's lifetime seriously, two or 300 times the donor's largest annual fund gift. So you're talking about somebody who gives 50 or 100 or 500 a year. It, they have a lot of people, especially these days, are very reluctant to part with cash <laughs> um, with the economy and what we went, just went through with the Great Recession. People are pretty um, 
leery of making big commitments, but they can make a commitment in their, in their estate plans. So your gift planning pool, uh, your planned gift donors pool may be as large as five times your capital gift pool, your, your, um, your uh, out of the checkbook kind of pool, people that give to you annually. So these statistics are, are pretty accurate. Um, they're obviously gonna move from year to year, but about a third of any donor is gonna consider a charitable bequest. And to me, the bigger surprise is that so how many bequests are made by those folks who are 55 and younger or 45 and younger. And if you think about it, it makes sense because that's the time when parents are starting to think about plans for taking care of their kids should something happen to them. So that's when they're starting to write their first trusts. And if you can get into their trust at that point, and you can steward that donor properly, boy, you're in there for, for a long time. But don't be, so don't be thinking that it's only folks that are 60s or 70s or 80s. Uh, the reality is that people are changing their trust at that point because life situations change, their kids are out of college, their grandkids are out of college, and they may be more willing to make a, a gift at that point because they feel like their financial situation is, is pretty stable. But um, people, are, people will put charities of, their, of interest to them into their trusts as early as their first trust gift, which might, first trust um, writing, which might be in the 40s or 50s. So um, the thing, the other surprising thing to me is that um, most people have not been asked for a gift. So if we're saying 22% over 30 say they have been asked for a planned gift, that means that the vast majority of your donors have not been asked. And this is a remarkable opportunity to talk to people who are already interested in your organization. Um, because once again, going back to the point of it's many, many times their annual gift, the average is thirty-five and, and, and $70,000. Uh, and if you start getting kinds of gifts coming in, that's going to make a big difference um, to your annual income for your organization. So you need to talk to your donors. Um, and who should you be talking to? Well, obviously, anyone who has notified you they've made a planned gift or has asked you for information about your charity uh, or bequest language, be sure to have, even on your website, basic language of, uh, that they can in, uh, include in their trust. Um, but even if they haven't made, uh, let you know that they've made a planned gift, your loyal donors, making regular gifts of any size, really, it doesn't matter how much. The ones who are giving you to, to you year after year after year, those are your best planned gift prospects. Um, once again, as I said, those, they've, they've, they already said they love you. They're giving you money every year. And uh, they may be not comfortable parting with large sums, but in their trust, in their estate, there may be some pretty sizable uh, gifts to be had if you keep in touch with them. So all income levels, you, not just the super wealthy. Um, and anyone who's made a stock gift, they've got an you've, They've already made it a, a commitment to you that way. But don't forget your internal constituents because they may not be making monetary contributions, but they're making contributions with their time and their talent. So staff and faculty, if you're at a university, but board members and certainly volunteers. Volunteers can be some of the most loyal to your organization, whether you, um, they're, they're there every day or they're there weekly or monthly. Um, they're doing work for you for free. And uh, that's really a major commitment. So those kinds of constituents can honestly make a big difference in your planned gift pool. And also don't forget that you have external constituents too. Um, if you have conversations with wealth managers, tax advisors, or estate attorneys, private fiduciaries, those uh, professionals are speaking to donors potential donors all the time and might be asked, you know, look, I have this, I have some money I'd like to give. I'm kind of interested in this area. Do you know anybody who, who operates um, a charity in that area? And so don't, don't forget that. Um, the other thing is, a, is that people 
who make the small gifts. When we go back to loyal donors just making their small annual gifts of 50 or $100 or whatever it might be, mainly those folks don't get as much recognition as obviously the large gift donors. They, they'll get their, their tax receipt and maybe they'll get a, a, you know, an already printed, a pre-printed thank you card, but they're not getting recognition. And um, you'd be surprised how far a, just the, the, the act of reaching out to thank them to, and even to talk mm -hmm. about plan gift, how far that will go when they, I've talked to people who say, well, I don't give so much, you know, I only give about a hundred dollars a year. And we talk about the impact of the long loyal gifting. And it makes a, a it, it makes a big difference in these people's lives to, to think that, wow, we, we care about even the small gifts. So believe me, that may, it goes a long way. Um, so what you should be doing is, is that, and remember that many donors have already left a gift to your organization in their estate plan. So just sort of assume that they have. And um, so study your list for uh, loyal donors who fit a plan giver profile. And once again, the number one on that list is loyal, long and long time loyal donors. Um, you can review meeting reports for past hints from your donors that they might in fact have your organization in their estate plan and um, get out and talk face to face to your donors. There's no better, um, no better way than that because the best source of information about the donor, of course, is the donor, him or herself, to tell you what they're interested in and, and what resonates with them with your organization. Um, the thing is, you need to be aware of why people give. Uh, it's really not necessarily just for the tax benefits, um, although that can be part of it, but really they give because they're passionate about a particular thing or area. Um, they give to causes, they, they, they don't give to, they give to things that are important to them. And, and so when you're talking to your donors about planned gifts, focus on their motivations. That's gonna be inspiring to them if you understand why they're motivated to give even $50 a year to your organization. And obviously these are long-term conversations. These aren't checkbook gifts. These aren't where they can say, oh yeah, yeah, here, here's 50 bucks. Cause yeah, I like this, this, uh, this little program you're on right now. Um, but make sure you, you, you understand their expectations and what their motivations are and steward early, steward often, that's the best thing you can do um, to, to really cultivate these planned gift um, donors. So get to know them as much as you can as an individual. Um, you ask your basic questions about their goals learn to recognize their verbal cues, uh, especially somebody who might say, well, you know, I'd love to give more, but um, there's somebody who wants to be talked to about a planned gift for sure. And he, you can talk about the, the impact of a, a gift in an estate, but you can also talk to them about impacts of a gift through a, um, a life income type gift, like a CK and that sort of thing. But really learn to hear what they're trying to say to you about how much they love your organization and they wish they could do more, but here they are in this other kind of or, uh, situation. I've got to get my kids through college or that kind of thing. Um, so get, you can create some materials and they're very, very available. Create some materials that will get your donors thinking about planned gifts, um, why it's impactful, why it's important, why your organization appreciates that and so keep in touch and don't miss an opportunity to thank them for their support loyal donors do make the best planned gift donors and honestly and truthfully planned gift donors tend to increase their current gift that is a fact so so when you you when somebody puts you in their will or trust we say that we've been elevated to the status of family right because when you're putting somebody in your estate plan as a friend or family member and if you're in there, that's where you are too. So you, you, you hold a special place in that donor's heart. Make sure you stay there. And they will, once they're engaged that way, honestly, they do, they do tend to increase their current gifts as well. So, so let's talk about stewarding because that's why we're all here. Um, you know, we tend to think about stewardship as sort of an after the gift activity uh, in current gift donors, they write you a check, you send them a thank you, you might invite them to an event, 
but we fail to recognize um, that we to steward properly donors who aren't making their who are making their gifts in their estate plans, who are not necessarily making their big gifts right now. So as I said, as I said before, if we don't know who they are, we can't thank them, and that's a missed opportunity to honor them for their belief in the missions of our organizations. And what we end up doing is thanking the attorney or the trustee who's administering the estate and who many times may not have a connection with the family, even the family of the donor. So that means we're losing out on opportunity, not only to thank the person who is making this gift, which is remarkable, but also their family who might want to be engaged further in, in learning about how um, important and impactful that donor's gift is to the organization down the road. So it's, it's really, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to make sure that your planned gift donors are thanked and included and feel like they're a part of your organization, uh, an important part of your organization. So one of the first things you can do, it's easy to do, is create a legacy society. Um, as we er talked about earlier, many gifts are revocable, so make sure that they feel appreciated, that they feel like this is not just some gesture that you're taking for granted and you only care about the folks that are writing a check today. Um, create a special society. Uh, we call ours at, the Uni at UC San Diego, we call ours the York Society. And that's in honor of Herb York, who was our first chancellor. And um, he was also a generous donor during life and, and also through his estate. So fitting for us, but there's gonna be an, there's clearly going to be some other aspect of your organization that makes a, that makes a good name for your legacy society. Uh, but the idea is that this is a special place for this key donor group. Uh, a lot of times, it's only the larger donors who get put into special groups and, and that sort of thing. And, and this way you can say, you know, you're all part of a group that believes in the future of this organization and has said so by making a planned gift. And um, so you can create insider information and targeted activities for, this, for these folks. Um, the other point is be as inclusive as possible. At, uh, for us, all a donor has to do is tell us of their intentions. Every, if all of you respond right now and say, yes, UC San Diego is in my uh, state plan, you are going to be a member of the York Society. And it just is a way for us to reach out to more and more people, let everybody know about what's going on at the university. And um, believe me, there's going to be something that interests everybody. But it, it really says, you know, you're important. We're going to treat you like an important member of our family. And um, we send out um, three or four times a year. Um, uh, newsletters, we send invitations to various events on campus that we think they might be interested in. And some of it is they may not be able to go, but they know they're included. They know that they're welcome to come on campus and, and learn about all the various things that are, that are going on here. So that's what we do in general, um, but individually we try to, once somebody's let us know where they're, they're in, uh, we're in their estate plan, we try to get details of their intention and their interests so that so you know, somebody might say, "Well, I'm going to I'm going to leave X dollars to um, the engineering school or the medical school um, or uh, any other aspect of, of campus," and we can make sure that the folks that are working in those programs are aware and send them information, them included as well. So it's important to keep track of that kind of information internally. However, you might keep track of those donor um, donor details and communicate with those donors. You can segment them easily and, and with an emphasis on those areas of interest. And the other important thing to think about is making sure you keep your stewardship going even if the current giving decreases or even stops. And that actually does tend to happen as a donor gets older. Um, when they start getting into their 70s and 80s, they're, you know, they may just, they may not give as much as they did previously, or they may feel like they've They've, um, you know, they've, they've given a lot uh, over the past 20 years, and they know they've got a lot in their in their estate plan for you. So don't think just because the the um, giving current giving has stopped or decreased that you're not still in their plan. In fact, it's even more important to make sure they're thanked and and they are feeling good about your organization. 
So say thank you often, right? Say thank you often, stay in touch all year. Um, one of the big things that resonates is donor stories, true stories of success, true stories of what, why a, a real donor gave in a particular way to your organization. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, um, when people hear donor stories, especially if you can have a variety of them from a variety of different aspects, pe your other donors, the people who are reading those stories or listening to those stories will start thinking about their own life and start connecting in their own way to, to your organization or the, that aspect of, um, of giving. So it's, it's called, uh, Russell James calls it autobiographical visual, visualization. They're reflecting on their lives. They're, trying, they're connecting with your organization and how those, those two things intersect. So make sure that, that you tell those stories. You can put them on your website. Uh, make sure your donors um, stay informed and tied to your mission. Uh, we send to our planned gift donors, we send birthday greetings, Thanksgiving cards. You may have another way of communicating, but making sure that you, you say thank you several times a year, and not just for gifts. Um, we do a couple times a year send out some little gifts, very token gifts, and, and we try to visit with everybody that we can at least once a year. Um, we've been choosing gifts that with a story that resonates with our mission and message. For example, last fall, we had an alumna, alumnus who uh, was a coffee roaster, and he, for every pound of coffee he sells in his business, he and his partner give 10 pounds of food to local food banks. And we thought that story was just so amazing. Um, and it was an alumnus, um, loved the university. We went and got little four, little small little packages of coffee, told his story with this gift and said thank you to our planned gift donors for their belief in the university and what they did. So it it's, you know, it was a lovely gesture. It's something that they probably, I hope, like coffee or give it to somebody who does, but it still is, uh, ties them back to the university. This fall, we are sending around um, little desk, really actually lovely desk um, calendars. They, we, we locally sort claimed wood for the stand and we've made 12 cards for the 12 months of the year. But the important part is on the back, is a story about UC San Diego, some aspect of UC San Diego. And we tried to run as much of the gamut as we could. Um, and then we were telling people, and they're really actually lovely. They were, they were um, designed in a very lovely way. So it's something that somebody might actually like to put on their desk, <laughs> which is important. Um, and then we've told them that we're gonna be sending them another one next year so that please keep these beautiful little wooden stands that they've, they've received. And we'll have 12 more stories about different aspects of the university so they, it, it resonates with them and tells them a little bit more about what we're doing. So that's what we try to do. We, we're celebrating all the connections. Um, we work with our donor relations group, and I have to say I, I can't thank them enough for all their creativity and hard work. But um, we create a calendar of events for as many areas of interest as we can to where we can invite our York Society members. So it's, it's a program or a lecture or something, an activity that that is going to be happening anyway. And then we just invite them to come. Um, we'll, if there's a fee involved, we'll pay for it. Um, so even if they can't kind of them, and they should realize that they do have access to the university. Um, you know, the more you get to know your your donors, um, through a phone call or a personal visit or a note um, that you reach out to them. It really is true of all donors, but the more you get to know them and the more you can be on the lookout for ways to make extra touches that will resonate with them because you know what's important to them is that each person has a slightly different way they like to get in touch or stay in touch. Some like, some like uh, written newsletters, some like emails, some like personal visits more than others. Um, some like to do all their business via, you know, on the phone. So it's just knowing your, your donors well is, is, a, is a good stewardship approach because you're respecting their point of view on things. 
Um, so the more you can detail in your donor records, the more successful you're going to be in solidifying and, and probably even expanding your relationship with those people. You know, use social media along with the more traditional means of communicating. Uh, our younger, our younger plan gift donors, of course, uh, are using social media, but honestly, um, grandparents are on Facebook to stay in touch with their, their kids and grandkids. So um, that's, we do have a Facebook page, uh, but we also have our own website that's connected to the university website. So try to do that. Um, this, uh, special gift planning page on your general website or a message. And um, so you wanna give useful information about planned gifts on that page. And also, once again, be sure to tell donor stories. Uh, that's what resonates. That's if you're gonna do one thing, tell donor stories because people will connect with that and they'll see a face and a situation that might mirror theirs. So you wanna look for ways to help when you're talking to your donors. Um, they don't always know about all the financial benefits of planned gifts. Um, they might have made one, but they don't know about the other opportunities and their situations might change. So you're always looking for ways to help. Um, they may not be able to realize they may have, uh, can support your, your organization with a gift larger than they thought possible. Even the most sophisticated donors don't know about the benefits of, of gift planning. So don't assume um, that they know everything that you do about gift planning. So saying thank you and keeping in touch um, and asking questions allows you to be of service. Just asking, what can I do to help? Is there anything you need? Um, it'll ensure that they are stay connected to your organization for years to come, of course. So what you can do right now is, what we were talking about previously, we can, you can go into your database and see if you can find a number of actual or potential gift planning, uh, gift plan, uh, plan gift donors, um, and create a plan. You know, how are you going to talk to these folks and, and have, a, have a, a plan that you can follow throughout the year that's written down so you're going to follow it um, and make sure it incorporates not only written communication but, but in-person touch points. And once again, underscore the need for face-to-face -face visits as often as you can, as you can do that. Um, so that's, that's what I came to talk about. <laughs> and I'm welcoming any, any questions that people have. Perfect. Thank you, Kim. Yes, before anyone goes, and feel free to chime in on your questions on the Q&A or chat, we wanted to just let you know that the next webinar is January 17th on cause selling with yours truly. So you get to hear my voice three months in a row. <laughs> we'll break it up after that. But we will be sending out the registration link soon. So stay tuned for marketing information and, and more info on, on the next cause selling webinar. At this time, we wanted to ask Kim some questions on her fabulous um, presentation. Uh, one of the first questions that you know, came to my mind as I heard your speak, and then we'll, we'll bring some questions in, Kim, is, you know, you guys have such an established plan giving program, which is wonderful, and it, it seems like there's been a, a history of that. What, what are your recommendations for organizations out there that might not have one and are on this webinar to potentially get inspired to launch one? What, what are those first steps? The first step is to look at your, your donor base and, and see who are your loyal donors. Really, that is, that is the very first place to start. How many, when your donors have been giving five, seven, 10 or longer years to you, those are the people you wanna reach out to. Um, there are many, many resources uh, for you to get information for planned gifts. There are uh, on, online, plenty of, of ways that you can find uh, information on basic plan gifts. So, but the first thing is to, to try, as I said in, in earlier on, is to maybe do a little bequest um, campaign, just asking people, are you in, are they in your, uh, are you in their trust? And I would, uh, but definitely reach out. That's the only way you're gonna, many, way, many times the only way you're gonna know is if you ask. 
fabulous, thank you. A question from one of our uh, participants. What if a donor wants to designate their gift to a certain area? Is there a certain type of documentation that they need or what does that look like, especially at UC San Diego? So what we do is we try to work with the donor and or their attor trust attorney in giving the specific, um, some specifics so that it's, we can ensure that their gift gets to exactly where they want it to go. Our goal is to make sure that the donor's wishes are, um, are met. And so we make sure that we, we give the tax ID number of our foundation. That's really important. Um, and we also give them language that will help them designate a particular fund or school or program where they want, it, where they want to give their money. And the, you want to be specific without being overly specific because over time, programs might change but you can always give them mitigating language as well so that says, says something like you know if this xyz program does not exist um i ask that you give my gift to a program that as closely mirrors this the purpose of that program as possible so you want to um you want to be specific without being so specific that you're going to have problems down the road but we work, that's why we want to work directly with donors. We want to work with their attorneys. And once again, that has to do with um, asking the question and, and giving them the information. Uh, and one of my roles is, as the uh, Trust and Estate Administration, I see a lot of times people who have not asked us for the information and uh, for the specific information on how to give money easily to their, to the foundation and to the group that is important to them at the university and it just you know it it becomes if, it, if it's a mystery to us it delays the gift going to the appropriate group so um, the more uh, communication you can have early on the better and once again these gifts are you know they can be changed at any time and that's what we tell our uh, we've had many groups that or, or donors who have sort of changed their interest and they so they will change their language. But um, we had one um, donor who said, you know, I want to make my, my uh, gift a little more specific in my estate. And we talked to him and it turned out that he wanted to fund a, a scholarship and he wanted to fund a scholarship with a particular purpose. And through the conversation of, of of finalizing and detailing his estate gift, he ended up creating a scholarship for now so that he can meet with his um, scholarship recipients now. And he's delighted, he and his wife are delighted with having a current use gift that is also gonna be supported in his estate. So that's one thing we didn't talk about today and that is how you can blend gifts um, from current use into uh, and augment them with estate gifts. That's a whole other topic. But it really all goes back to having conversations with your donors and, and giving them the right information. Right. Is there a certain amount of time or, or uh, frequency of stewardship touches that you'd recommend? I know you gave a lot of uh, suggestions, but is would you recommend at least four times a year, or what's that? Yeah, you know, a lot of times it has to do with what your staff situation is, and you know, if you have a large staff, or is it? all on you um, it can be difficult to have uh, once a month or seven I, I think that the the standards they say seven times a year seven touches a year but whatever seems to make sense to you whether it's quarterly that's not a bad sort of goal sort of a quarterly outreach um, but if you have things on your website that are updated on a regular basis you know people can find it that way too but we I think we, we shoot for six or seven times a year, but we have a larger group. Um, but I think you know quarterly, that's an easy thing to, to sort of work into your calendar, I would think. Another question, is there a, a process that you go through to kind of revise and revisit your current legacy or, or plan giving list? Um, well, once again, we are very fortunate to have a, um, a research staff that that helps us out and one of the things that my colleagues and I do are um, we have a, a, 
a qualifying list. So we know that once again, we're looking for loyal donors and we'll go and call them and reach out to them and, and ask to talk to them about, about their previous gifts and what interests them about the university and that sort of thing. Um, keeping in touch with existing planned gift donors does help you to know if, if there's something going on. And, um, and you need to make sure that nothing is happening that is disappointing them or, or confusing them about what's, what's going on with the organization. But it's really monitoring your donor list and seeing at a certain point what they've, how many times they've given or where they've given that sort of thing, communicate to them about that. That was another question too is, if you're communicating four to seven times a year, generally to the group, uh, how often are you communicating more specifically on what their interests are, or is that included in the regular communications? Um, so what we try to do is change up the topic areas each time we, we send out a communication so that we're, we are either, we're topical in terms of what's going on, let's say in Washington, um, or might be, we'll, we'll change up the various areas that we talk about so that we start, the, so that we cover all the various areas of, of gift planning. If we seem to, if we're seeing a lot of questions in one area, we'll respond to that too. But we, we try to cover the gamut as much as possible. We talk about different aspects of the university in our various communications. So once again, we cover a broader gamut of, of what's going on at the university as well. Great, and what about board members? How are board members engaged in plan giving? So what we try to do is um, our group doesn't, we don't have a board that we are responsible for directly. So that's where our, that's where our uh, collaboration comes in with our, with our, um, our colleagues in various other areas who might be working with a board. And we will, we will actually come in and talk to the board about gift planning and, and how that's gonna make a difference to that um, aspect of the university. Um, so, so as I say, we work with colleagues and because they certainly know their donors better than we know their donors and their board members better than we know their board members. And I think that um, a little legacy push to board members is, is a good thing and we can help facilitate that. All right, one final question for Kim. I don't think we're gonna get to everyone's, but there was a couple questions around training and getting more information on this topic. Obviously we're here mm -hmm. at Sanford Institute of Philanthropy to, provide webinars and more content in different affiliate regions, but what else would you recommend? Are there any resources or websites that folks could go to for more information? Well, um, yes, there are certainly, there's certainly um, industry groups that, and they're regional, um, plan giving partnerships um, are, which is now uh, charitable gift planners, um, offer seminars all the time. They have um, regional conferences that always, always have a gift planning 101 aspect to it. On the very first day, you can get in and all the basics and of, of gift planning. So just look into in your area for a gift planning industry group who might have, um, who, will, who will undoubtedly have seminars or, or webinars or conferences where the basics on gift planning uh, is offered. Um, and I think also online, there are many, organiza many organizations that offer information from, uh, to learn about more about the basics of gift planning and, and gift planning um, techniques. Fabulous. Can you also explain your um, certification in plan giving, where that came from? So that is a, a group that that's um, a certification that has been around for, I'm, I'm thinking it's 20, I know it's 20 plus years I, uh, at, at Cal State Long Beach. And um, the group I was in, the cohort I was in, uh, had we had people from all around the country as far away as Maine. Um, all of, from all across the country. And it's a year long program um, that goes into the, all the various aspects of gift planning. Uh, you end up, so you have to, you have six classes, uh, two day classes. So every other month you're going up to, you're going to this group um, for two days at a time. And at the end you write a, 
um, a practicum. So, and you're taking tests after after each uh, each module, um, and it has their you know uh, continuing education credits involved as well. So it it's a really good. I recommend it honestly if you can get to Long Beach. <laughs> um, it's a really good program that will cover all aspects of gift planning. Um, so that that's a that's a bigger commitment actually. It's not in it is not inexpensive and it's a bigger time commitment, but it's a very good program. Awesome. I am told we have a little more time, so we have a couple more questions okay. for you, Kim. Um, the conversation around staff turnover with mm -hmm. plan giving relationships you is a great question you really talked about developing this relationship and and getting to know the donor what are some recommendations for staff turnover and how have you seen that be effective yes I, turnover is a perennial problem in all of fundraising um, appears to be so it's not unique to gift planning i think that the key here, yes, personal relationships are, are really important, um, but remember that, that the donor is um, committed to a, a particular, your organization or a particular aspect of your organization. Um, I think that um, it's something that you're never gonna be able to get away from turnover, but if you can, if somebody is, is leaving, moving on to something else, if you can create a transition plan where where particular donors are sort of handed off to different different folks and you make that introduction, it, it's, it goes a long way to, to mitigating the feeling of, well, wait a minute, I was talking to Sue yesterday and where'd she go? Uh, it, it does have a lot to do with, with staying in touch. And, but remember again, that your donors are giving to your organization or an aspect of it that they find Res that resonates with them. So respecting that as that part of it um, and just staying in touch, I think is, is the best way I can think of to mitigate the turnover issue. And, and you talk a lot about stewardship and, and cultivation. Do you have a way that you recommend measuring the effectiveness of your stewardship? Is there an evaluation tool that you all use or how have you measured the effectiveness of some of these stewardship techniques? One of the ways that we can talk about it is, does it result in another planned gift or another current gift? And a lot of times it will. Um, and for example, somebody who is, who, is, who is in their estate plan, just talking to somebody the other day, who's in their estate plan, uh, has, is creating a scholarship. But there is an aspect of the university that they are, he and his wife are very, very interested in. And so we talked about how he could create a uh, current um, endowed gift and how that would work. I, I spoke with, I worked with another donor who said, yeah, you know, you're in my, uh, you're a remainder beneficiary in my estate plan. And I'm really afraid, you know, if I die tomorrow, it's going to be great for you guys. But if I, you know, if I live for another 32 years, I'm not sure there's going to be enough left because it's a retirement aspect of thing, uh, plan. So we talked to him about creating the, gift now that will and endowing a gift now that supports the aspect of the university that he is most interested in and then it's just then fortified with whatever comes along in his estate when you know a long time from now he does pass away so once again that is the whole idea of marrying the current gifts with estate gifts and just understanding where the donor's passions are that answer the question i think so is there a way, you talked about where you're going to get planned giving prospects from your current donors. Are you ever looking to acquire donors right into your planned gift or do they already have a relationship with the organization before they become new prospects for the planned giving program? A lot of times, you know, it's interesting. A lot of times we will get a gift in a trust and we didn't know that donor existed. Um, I mean, literally, there was a huge multi-million dollar gift to us where the donor had the relationship with the physician and had not given dime one to the university prior to that gift. And, and so it would have been wonderful to have been able to steward that donor during life, but we just didn't know about it. There are a lot of times when we don't, 
we'll get a gift where we didn't know that donor was um, was in, including us in their estate. Um, it's it's once again it it has to do with reaching out and find. You're never going to 100% know all the planned gift donors, but the more you can figure that out, the more you can talk to them and 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 let them know you're thankful for their gifts now and in the future, the more information you're going to get, I think. I think they've covered it all. Thank you. Any final thoughts? Um, I would just, yes, I think that the, the idea is that, that um, a lot of the things we talked about today, of course, translate very nicely into what you might be doing with your current gift donors, with your annual donors. Um, reaching out, communicating with them, learning about what their interests are, uh, whether they or not they make a planned gift to you, a donor loves, you know, likes to be acknowledged, um, likes to know that their gift has made an impact. So I think the um, a lot of times stewardship is sort of put on the back burner because we're all worried about making goals and you know what has to come in the door today. But it's honestly it's 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 short sighted not to include stewardship as an important part of what you do weekly, annually uh, for your donors. And um, I, I would say that the more you steward your current use donor, your current gift donors, your checkbook donors, the more planned gift donors you're going to uncover and you're going to actually create because they'll, they'll realize that they, in fact, can make a huge impact in the future to this organization, your organization that they've already said they love. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Kim. Thank you all out there, all the way from London and beyond. We are going to share this presentation so that all of you can have that as a resource and Kim's uh, contact information if she wants to share that sure. as well. Absolutely. And we look forward to seeing you guys uh, or talking to you guys next month and have a great holiday season. Thank you.